Welcome to the Night Tube. I'm Stephen Knight and I'm very pleased to be joined by James Esses. James, how are you doing? Very well, Stephen. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I've been looking forward to speaking to you. I've been kind of noticing the controversy you've been caught up in of late. Uh, I appreciate there's a legal aspect to it, so I'm not sure how much we can get into in terms of detail, but perhaps it might be helpful for you to tell uh, my viewers who you are or perhaps who you were before this sort of whirlwind of controversy took over your your studying and life? Sure. So h- historically, I was a man of the law. I was, I was a criminal defence barrister. And then I, I spent a number of years working crime, criminal justice in the public sector. Um, and then I decided I would have a transition of my own, which was into the field of mental health. Um, that was off the back of quite a few years of volunteering in Childline as a counsellor which I found extremely fulfilling. It was the most fulfilling thing in my life, actually. And so I decided I wanted to do that and help people full time. And so I started um, undertaking a master's course in psychotherapy um, at the time that I was expelled, which I'm sure we'll get onto that in a moment. I was about three years into the course and I was just about to set up a private practice to start seeing private clients um, so I, I kind of had a bit of a plan as to where I wanted to go. And I was hoping in the not too distant future to basically fully transition into a vocation in psychotherapy. So explain to my uh, American listeners then what hmm. Childline is, what the concept is, what sort of service does that provide? Sure. So, I mean, Childline is basically a helpline. Um, it, it's for children. I mean, there's, there's adult helplines that some of your listeners may have heard of, for example, the Samaritans. Um But it's basically um, a helpline in which young people can come through either on the phone or on kind of a web chat and reach out for help or support or somebody to talk to um, for any issue, really, ranging from um, bullying uh, to uh, abuse at home to mental health conditions to self-harm and and even suicide. Um, And these young people can be completely anonymous um, and they can speak to us and come through as, as, as often as they like. I've always been, I've always wondered with Childline what sort of um, powers the people have who are on the other line. I mean, where where is the line between providing support uh, and advice and then referring it on if there's something more concerning contained within that conversation? Yeah, so I mean, Childline has its own counselling model that all of the counsellors have to operate within. Um, you know, generally it's a listening service. So it's, it's not there to give out advice or to right. tell you people what to do. Um, and crucially, it's an, it's an anonymous confidential service, but there are certain circumstances in which a young person's confidentiality might need to be breached, for example, if their life was in immediate danger. And so there's scenarios in which you might have to escalate it and notify the police, for example, or, or social services. Um so, but but primarily, it's it's a confidential service. So you're you're training towards becoming a qualified psychotherapist. You're studying towards you three years into the course. And where were you studying this? What institution? Yeah, so I was I was studying at a place called Messanoia Mesen- Institute um, in London. Um, it's a kind of standalone therapeutic institute. Um, the course I was doing is is um, accredited by Middlesex University. Yeah, so yeah, so the course I was doing, I mean, therapy tends to be taught not in universities, but in kind of standalone institutions. Um, so um, my course was accredited by Middlesex University, but it was taught in this place called Messanoia, which is in uh, West London. So obviously, you this isn't sort of a distance learning program or an online thing. You you'd physically have to be there. Correct. It's, right. it's very experiential. It's a lot of it is about the group that you're with, um, kind of group dynamics. Um, but it's yes, it's it's face to face learning. And then there's a lot of other uh, kind of vocational aspects to it. For example, you have to be in therapy yourself. Um, you have to be seeing clients voluntarily on a placement. I was doing that at Mind, the charity Mind. I was seeing clients every week. You have to be in supervision. So there's quite a lot else that goes along with the academic side of it. So obviously you've got a keen interest um, in children's welfare. Um, and when did the sort of um, issue surrounding gender dysphoria first come on your radar? What kind of things made you want to look at it a bit more closely? Yeah, um, it all began in Childline because I was noticing year on year a significant increase in the volume of young people that were coming through to talk to me 
with problems around gender and feeling that they're in the wrong body. And, uh, you know, as I began to speak to these young people, I began to hear things that were causing me some concern. You know, I, I children of very young ages, youngest I think I spoke to was probably nine or ten, uh, telling me that they, they were convinced they were in, born in the wrong body and that they wanted to transition, that they wanted to be put on medication and possibly one day have surgery um, to change their bodies. Um, and I was gently exploring, as was my ethical duty with these young people, you know, what do these words mean to them? You know, what, what did puberty mean to them? What did gender mean to them? And they were so young that they couldn't really tell me what these things meant. And, and that, that was raising some concerns for me because I was thinking, well, these young people aren't at a stage in which they can vocalise what puberty entails or what gender and sex mean to them. And yet they feel that they're trapped in the wrong body and want to take potentially irreversible medication. Um, I also began to hear of a lot of young people discovering online forums, chat rooms, etc., in which they were being spoken to by other people who had transitioned and kind of affirming them um, down this path and encouraging them and being supportive. Um, and often without their parents' knowledge uh, whatsoever. Mm. Um, so I, these kind of raised some red flags for me, but I, I felt it was incumbent upon myself to do my own independent research into this. So I, I began to immerse myself in all of the literature, all of the research papers on gender dysphoria and, and medication and treatment pathways. And I just found myself becoming more and more concerned about the pathways that we were potentially putting our children down. So maybe you could expand a little bit on gender dysphoria. What exactly is it and how does it manifest? Yeah, so in its, in its most basic form, it's a, it, it's a mental health condition. Um, it's recognised under the DSM, which is kind of one of the international classifications for mental health conditions. But it's um, it's, it's basically a kind of severe disease uh, and a feeling of a kind of mismatch between one's gender and one's biological sex. In order to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria, it has to be kind of of a particular level of severity in terms of the impact that it's having on you and how it's interfering with your life. Um, uh, but 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 in order to be able to transition either medically or legally um, in this country, you have to be diagnosed with that in the first instance. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of a lot of activists from the other side saying we shouldn't pathologize these things, but we have to come back to the fact that we are dealing with a mental health condition for which people are requesting potentially irreversible medication and surgery. I find it difficult to see how we cannot pathologize that. So, I mean, where's that um, ratio, do you think? I mean, in your experience speaking on the phone to people, your research since, the keen interest you have in it, where's that ratio between people who are suffering from, uh, a, you know, a genuine psychological malady such as um, gender dysphoria? I know that's kind of taboo to say, to sort of talk about in the, the, them sort of terms, um, versus this idea of social contagion we're hearing a lot about at the moment. You've mentioned sort of internet forums and that having an influence on people. What, what, I mean, what's the, I mean, could you put a number on it? Could you put a, a guesstimate on how many people are, are coming to it more from a social contagion aspect mm -hmm. versus uh, the gender dysphoria aspect? Well, the, the, I mean, the volumes and the demographics have changed over recent years. I mean, the volumes generally in terms of uh, particularly young people being referred to gender clinics um, has increased exponentially. Now, some people argue well, that's because people, these children feel more comfortable coming out and saying how they feel. Um, I guess there's a case to be made for that. But, but the increase is quite significant. There's also been a change in terms of the ratio of boys to girls. I mean, historically, the number of boys biological boys this is presenting at gender clinics significantly outweighed the girls and now it's flipped the other direction there's a term that's been coined you may have heard of it it's called rapid onset gender dysphoria and that particularly links with this kind of social contagion point that you point today is I mean anecdotally um schools classes both here and abroad in which a significant number of the girls in that classroom have within a matter of weeks and months all come out as transgender hmm. um, and si at a significantly higher rate than you would kind of find amongst the population in general. So that started raising question marks about, you know, kind of what is going on here. And also, I mean, it's, it's, it's a well-founded phenomenon, 
particularly amongst young girls, this kind of contagion. We've seen it, for example, in relation to anorexia and eating disorders in the past. Yeah, it's funny. I, I've got um, teenage girls in my family and, you know, some week they're, they're sort of pansexual, other weeks bisexual, some weeks gay. And the funny thing, I mean, it's not an issue, obviously, but the funny thing is all the friends are as well. And I suppose that's, you know, that's a way in which there's people find meaning or um, cred within them circles. And it's usually harmless and usually something people either realise they're gay or realise they're not and get on with their life. But we, we seem to be creating a situation now where people who express them kind of feelings at a young age could potentially be put on a path to transition. I mean, how much how much do we need to worry about that, do you think? Um, yeah, well, I mean, the point you're making is interesting. And I, I've heard people kind of compare the current trans phenomenon with like the way goths used to be hmm. I, I i'm i'm not going to make that comparison myself but it i i guess what that's getting at is this idea of kind of mm, childhood teenage years are an opportunity to experiment i mean there's so much change happening physiologically the biologically but socially that people are trying to figure out who they are and then maybe experiment and try out different things um and that includes trying out different ways of being in the world and playing around with masculinity and femininity. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I firmly believe, uh, and I think it's it's pretty common acceptance that we all have degrees of masculinity and femininity within us. Um, and I have some friends, you know, in the twenties and thirties, who, when they were going through the teenage years, did kind of flirt around with expressing themselves in different ways. But they've come and said to me, you know. If I were a child in this modern era, I think my parents would have sent me to a gender clinic and mm. I think I would have been put on puberty blockers um, simply because they were gender atypical. Um, and I've read recent studies of very, very young children being referred to gender clinics, again, both here and abroad, because they're gender atypical, i.e. they're a young girl who likes to play football and likes the colour blue. Um, that causes me quite a bit of concern because, you know, what, what message does that give to young people? It, it almost we're almost regressing back to old stereotypes. It's, it's this idea that if you're not a traditionally masculine boy or a traditionally feminine girl, maybe you're actually trapped in the wrong body, rather than maybe you're just a boy and a girl who likes to do things that the opposite sex tend to like to do. Yeah, that's a great point. It did feel like we were getting to a place where society understood it was okay to be a feminine male or a slightly masculine woman and that that was progression. And like you say, now we're sort of saying that's probably indicative of you being in the wrong body, which does feel like uh, a regression to stereotypes. So I suppose that's one aspect of it, this social contagion. Um, I I've seen a trend recently and obviously taking things online is never a good way to e extrapolate a serious data, but I'm seeing a, a quite a big trend of parents um, proclaiming they've got a trans baby or a trans infant. And it seems blatantly obvious to me that this sort of ideology is being pushed on the child rather than the child projecting it out to the parents. So, I mean, what explains that situation where you've got a parent seemingly so desperate to have a trans child that they sort of invent this scenario? Um, I, I, I think there could be a number of things at play. But I, I think if we go back to the narrative that's being used nowadays, and, and part of the problem, I mean, you know, the, the other side, the, the stonewalls of the world have been very successful in terms of kind of getting their message out there and having it almost used as common parlance. You know, I, I hear more and more people saying sex is assigned at birth. Um, which it isn't, um, you know, it's just, ident it's just identified and recorded. But, but as soon as you start using that type of language, all of a sudden, everything's up for grabs. All of a sudden, everything is a social construct and your little baby could be absolutely anything they want to be and they just don't know it yet. Um, and I see this too in schools. Uh, I've begun investigating over recent months materials usually provided by charities and third sector organisations to primary schools um, and some of the materials that have been taught to these young children are very concerning and I doubt many parents know about them but again often these lines around for example sex has been assigned at birth um, often painting 
coming out as transgender as a kind of a really amazing special thing and actually this idea that you're just cisgender as in just identify with the sex you were born in is kind of almost dull or boring it's done in very subtle ways i, I came across this um it's kind of like a, a a coloring book type thing and it's a story about these young children who live on this planet um and then some of them discover they're trans and they go across on this bridge to this other planet called like the, the trans planet and planet earth just looks like boring old planet earth uh, but as soon as they cross over this bridge to the trans planet there's sparklers and fireworks <laughs> and bright colors and they're all celebrating and laughing and dancing i mean re- reading that it almost seems particularly to a young child it's almost kind of boring if you just if you just identify the sex you're born and you're just boring and, and stale almost, um, you know it's far more exciting and fun to be over here on this new planet. Um, so I, th- I think it's very subtle ways of delivering these messages to young people. Um, I've also discovered kind of gender ideology being snuck in through the back door. So I, I came, I've come across a few examples of this. Um, it's it's computing lessons for secondary school students. Um, and there'll be a module on on computing language, which is coding, kind of binary coding. Um, and teachers are encouraged as part of this module to draw a comparison between computing language, which, which is binary, and human beings' gender, which is non-binary, and told to bring up a discussion in, with the children about that. What place gender ideology has in a computing class, I have absolutely no idea, but I can only imagine this is a way of getting in an ideology through the back door. It's strange. It's very reminiscent to me of the um, hardline religious conservative attempts to sneak in creationism or intelligent design into the classroom. It has a very religious flavour to this ideology. And I suppose, I mean, I, I feel like, I mean, obviously I will feel this way, but I feel like I'm trying to approach this empirically and in good faith and I, I would hate to have anyone who's trans suffer as a result of anything I do or say uh, that's not the goal and I'm just wondering how do we best separate the people who are just bigots and don't understand transgenderism and, and do seriously want to do harm versus people who are genuinely concerned about the issues and the truth of the matter. Well, that's all kind of gone out the window because now the status quo is that if you say anything to challenge that ideology, you're automatically a bigot or a transphobe. Yeah. And when we're in we're, when we're in that territory, it's impossible to have a rational conversation about these things. You know, I, I, I always make a point of saying this, but, but people with gender dysphoria, people who identify as trans, children or adults, deserve to be treated with respect. They deserve to be listened to. They deserve to have med- medical support. Um, and they deserve to be able to kind of present how they want to the world and live the lives that they want. Um, what, what shouldn't be happening is a shutdown of conversation on this topic because it's a, partic- it's a very complex and sensitive topic. Um, but as, when you get into the territory of shutting down or cancelling people, as happened to myself, once you get into the territory of mandating language that other people must use on pain of even potentially criminal punishment, I think we're in very, very dangerous waters there. Um, so I, I'm hoping and praying that at some point we'll be able to kind of get back into a place where we can have what might well be difficult, emotive conversations, but they're absolutely necessary to have. And I think they're in everyone's interests, not least the people suffering from gender dysphoria, because they deserve the right treatment for them. Did you know this topic was a landmine before you approached it or, or were you just genuinely surprised by the reaction you got? Um, I, you know, I guess the signs were there. I, I often tell the anecdote and, and this actually was probably one of the first instances where I kind of thought something's up here. But when I went in for one of my shifts at Childline, um, and there, was, there were posters by Stonewall plastered all over the wall, um, which I'd never seen before. And they all said, some people are trans, get over it. Which I find is a very kind of hard line, quite aggressive use of language and, and very much um, a, a chilling effect on free speech and open debate and conversation about this. And I was wondering why this chari- why, why the charity that I was at, you know, the NSPCC was 
was plastering this all over the wall. It, it, it made me as a counsellor feel unable to really discuss this with my supervisors there and my fellow counsellors. Um, so I guess the signs were there. But in, in terms of what happened to me, I, I, I didn't believe it when it happened. And even though it's many months ago, I still, quite, I still don't believe it, actually. I, 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 think, I think the discourse and the impact on free speech in this space is terrifying. Yeah, I mean, that whole some people are trying to get over it is obviously a, a sort of reworking of the famous Stonewall. Some people are gay, get over it. And that in that context works and it seems to be a strong, powerful message. But I suppose using it in the context of trans people is very dismissive of some very serious issues that some people don't need to get over. Some people will never get over uh, unless they're addressed properly. So, I mean, you, you seem to you seem to start getting in a lot of hot water in this area when you um, started a petition. Now, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but in the UK, you can start an online petition. And if there is a significant response, I think it may be over, over 10,000 respondents. I think the government uh, will respond to it. So tell me a little bit about this p- petition. What, what inspired you to do it? What was contained within it and how long after putting that out there did you realize you might have been in a bit of trouble yeah so i i tried to um try and raise my concerns within the profession originally i kind of written an article and um, which ended up being published on quilles um about some of the considerations around gender dysphoria and children um in the uk there's kind of various accreditation bodies that govern therapists and i, I was a member of one it's called ukcp it's the united kingdom council for psychotherapy i wrote to them with a copy of my draft article raising some concerns about their own policy and asking for a conversation um not only were my points ignored but i was told that they were going to report me to my university for having raised this with them um and we might come back onto that a bit later because actually they're um well, I'm, I'm also taking them to court um, for discrimination along with the university. But anyway, off the back of that experience, I thought I need to find some like-minded therapists. They must be out there. And that's how I became involved in this group that I'm kind of a co-founder of called Thoughtful Therapists. We've got our website. You can you can read about us on that. Um, basically, a group of long uh, like-minded trainee, but also long-standing professional therapists in the UK um, with concerns about how we're treating gender dysphoria. Um, So along with them, we decided to publish this petition because we knew that there was conversion therapy legislation on the horizon. Um, And, you know, we had seen what's happened in other jurisdictions in which the legislation has been so badly worded that it it seemingly prevents therapists from doing anything other than affirming someone towards transitioning. Um, So I penned the petition asking the government as part of this ban to safeguard explorative therapy for children. Um, And we got 10,000 signatures in a matter of weeks. And subsequently, we actually got a very favourable response from the government, promising to safeguard um, the independence of therapists, uphold free speech, protect children. So it was all good stuff. Um, And I had done some associated interviews and and some quotes for some articles alongside the petition. Um, uh, and that's where everything went upside down. Um, uh, and basically, I, I, I got an email from my place of study one day entitled Termination of Contract. Um, and it was a two paragraph email. And I was, I was told that I was being expelled with immediate effect um, because I brought them into disrepute. Um, I wasn't provided with any evidence. I wasn't provided with any policies this had been done under. I wasn't provided with a single opportunity to speak to anyone. I never even had a conversation about it. I wasn't provided with an appeal. Um, When I went to respond to the email that day, I discovered they'd already blocked my university email address, so I couldn't even respond to it. Um, And then when I went onto Twitter that evening, I discovered that the university had publicised the expulsion to all of their thousands of followers. I mean, that's just unprofessional, isn't it? Well, when we consider that I was studying at an institute training therapists in which listening, understanding and empathy are core conditions of being there, it did seem particularly at odds with their own (laughs) ethical code. 
Yeah, that's a very eloquent way of putting it. Um, so before we get into the details of that, I'd just like to head back to, I suppose, the topic of conversion ther- therapy, because that's a very scary term to a lot of people. It sort of invokes thoughts of sort of aversion therapy with gay people, uh, you know, electroshock therapy in some instances, all these horrible things you hear gay people were put through in order to sort of, uh, cu- you know, quote unquote, cure them. Uh, and obviously... There's some obviously there's some very good reasons to want to ban that and want to prevent it being a treatment. However, in the context of transgenderism, that's not uh, even close to what you're campaigning for, is it? No, no, not at all. I mean, I think it's worth saying that conversion therapy, um, particularly as most people would think of it, as you just described, is absolutely abhorrent. You yeah, know, it's horrific, and many people have suffered over the years. Um, thankfully. Most of it is caught and outlawed by original and existing criminal legislation. So the type of kind of shock treatment you're talking about, or some of those aversion therapies, you know, are outlawed in this country. Um, Yeah, just a few comments on conversion therapy. The first thing is the term conversion therapy itself is a misnomer, um, because all of the various studies that have been done and presented to the government show that the vast majority of these practices take place in religious settings or within the family home. Um, in fact, the, the head of the report um, to the government um, on the conversion therapy ban, Dr. Adam Jowett, recently said that the term conversion therapy is extremely misleading. Um, why they continue to use it is another matter, but they've acknowledged it's a misleading term. But it, it it's misleading because it makes, I think, members of the public think that there's accredited trained therapists up and down the country doing these practices Unfortunately, and you will get that there, there are a very, very small number of therapists trained who probably are carrying out these things, but the, the, the numbers are absolutely tiny. Um, so I would like us to move away from using the term conversion therapy altogether, to be honest with you. Um, but yes, as I said, I mean, most of these practices are caught by existing legislation. Our, our concern is this, if worded badly, as has been done in other countries, that a therapist who doesn't merely affirm a client into transitioning, who takes time to explore, for example, explore comorbidities, explore that person's childhood and background, could be accused of carrying out conversion therapy. It's odd, isn't it? Because there's some good data to suggest that many people suffering with gender dysphoria tend to desist later on uh, if treated. I mean... There's a lot of figures thrown about and there's different studies, but there's there's a number of studies seemingly showing that amongst children, at least 80% of them, if given time, will eventually settle into their bodies, into their biological sex. Um, and that's where an old term called watchful waiting was coined. Um, that was kind of, at one point, the proposed treatment for gender dysphoria amongst children. It was basically explore things with a young person and give it time. Um, so we have that statistic and then we have the fact that there's other studies that show that if young people are put on puberty blockers, they have upwards of 90% chance of then progressing onto cross sex hormones, Mm. which supports this idea that it's kind of a slippery slope. But if we know that the vast majority of young people will desist naturally, why, why are we putting them down this potentially irreversible medical pathway? Yeah, that makes sense. So you get this email, uh, you're you're out essentially without discussion or question. They block your email address. Uh, did you ever at all manage to get a discussion with anyone about it? Could you get in the room with somebody to talk about it? A phone call, a correspondence on email? Uh, still to this day, I've never had a conversation. So what, I mean, apart from bringing the institution in disrepute, what sort of things... Was there anything else of note in this email to you? Um, they, they mentioned that they had had a few complaints. But again, I, I, I wasn't told who the complaints were from or how many or what they said. Um, but yes, I, I, I was aware that there were a few complaints. And, and I, I was also aware that some people had complained on Twitter. So in your... I mean, I mean it's difficult to obviously address this given there is a legal aspect to it, but... Is there anything you may know about the policy of the institution that would suggest that they went about this the wrong way, that they should have consulted you first, perhaps, or, or, or you know, at least 
discussed it. Yeah, I mean, uh, they, and I've made this kind of clear publicly before, and it forms part of the base of my case. I mean, they, they, they breached all of their own policies. I mean, as you would imagine for an educational institute, they have a certain steps that they have to go through for disciplinary procedures. Um, they have to convene a panel. Um, they have to give you an opportunity to represent yourself. They have to, if you fail, get, be granted an appeal. They also have to implement, um, if they find you to have kind of committed misconduct, they have to give you a reasonable kind of proportionate um, sanction. When I went to look at their policy subsequently, it had a list of kind of types of misconduct and the types of sanction that would be suitable for them. The types of sanction, sorry, the type of misconduct that would be suitable for immediate expulsion, as what happened to me, included sexual assault, uh, large-scale fraud uh, and physical abuse on campus. So all serious crimes, really. And in contrast, all you seem to be doing is expressing an opinion, op an opinion granted that seems to be taboo in certain circles, especially academia. But they, I mean, how how much must that institution be captured by this ideology to be so... Um, to act in such a strong and negative way to your views that they have to expel you outright. And how how indicative of this is, in your view, it, is it of academia in general at the moment? Because a lot of this does seem to be coming out of the academic institutions. I mean, it's completely intertwined with ideology and beliefs. I mean, that's why the base of my case is of discrimination uh, about my beliefs around sex and gender, which is at the heart of where I'm coming from on, on this topic. But um, you know, in, in, in the tweet in which they expelled me, they kind of put out a message of solidarity to the LGBT community. And I don't think you can get much more of a stark kind of link than that, actually. It's very much saying to those people, this guy, this chap, this wrong and is against you, but don't worry, we're with you. Yeah, that's that's awful, right? So, I mean, were there any instances or moments when you had disagreements with people within the institution before any of this? Did you, was there any sort of altercations or arguments on the premises or correspondence what might have got a bit testy perhaps or crossed any sort of line? Never. I, I, I never even really raised this topic because, as I said, I, I, was, I was working with my group of thoughtful therapists um, I'd already tried to raise my concerns with the accreditation body and there was pushback from them. I, I just wanted to keep my head down, work hard, um, get my qualification and start to help people. I mean, as a, I'd, I'd just been signed off for private practice a few weeks before this happened, actually. So I, I was I had already I'd created my website. Um, I, I was ready to go. Um, and as far as I was aware, I was doing pretty well on the course. Um so, you know, I kind of felt that I had my whole future ahead of me, but I, I no, I'd never had a single conversation on this topic with any of the kind of senior management ever. So the only things this can really be based on is your social media activity, this Quillette article, and perhaps this petition then? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the petition, it's the article. And then, as I said, I, I'd done a few other kind of YouTube interviews or given some quotes for a few articles relatively small number and, and all related to the petition and i mean obviously i don't know you personally we've been speaking for a short amount of time i've read some of your writing i've seen your social media outpost you seem like a very professional and measured person in your language i mean i might yeah I might be getting you on a good day i don't know but it doesn't you don't strike me as somebody who goes wading in all you know inflammatory and insensitive well i, I thank you and I, I appreciate you saying that and that's how i try and live my life because um, for, firstly, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm willing to listen to other people's views. I want to hear other people's views. I want to be able to have these discussions and debates. Um, I don't believe resorting to name calling and trying to get people cancelled or ruin people's livelihoods and reputations is the way to go about it. I mean, that just won't achieve anything at all. Um, so, yes, I, I always try and present myself in a measured way and, and I don't get personal. I always try and come back to the discussion points, to the statistics, to the evidence, which is partly because of my background in law as well, I think. So how long after your expulsion did you think that legal action was the most appropriate response? When did you start legal proceedings? Um, well, in the immediate aftermath of it, I basically crumbled. Um, and, you know, 
uh, I won't ever get that day out of my memory. And, and I, you know, I still, in fact, I was, I was back because um, I found out when I was at my mother's um, house and I was back there today and I was sat at the same desk doing some work and I felt a sense of unease even just being there. But I, I was in a very bad state and I was quite inconsolable because my life was basically over as far as I was concerned. I mean, I, I'd been working towards this for years. I'd spent tens of thousands of pounds on this course and it had all gone up in smoke simply because I felt that I was trying to protect children and safeguard children. Um, so it took quite a few days to kind of get out of this um, rut. But I, I began to talk to some people, some of the people closest to me, some of my group, thoughtful therapists. And what I kept hearing was, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely abhorrent. They cannot do this. You know, you, you need to seek justice. And so off the back of that, I sought some legal advice and I was told, you've got a strong case. You, you know, you've got a very strong case, actually. Um, the problem at that point was around funding, because as I'm sure you and your listeners know, it's not cheap to bring litigation. Um, and I'd spent so much money on this course as well. Um, so I was basically told well, the only option is kind of crowdfunding it. Um, and I wasn't sure whether that would be a success or not, to be honest, because there's been quite a few crowdfunding campaigns in the UK recently for, for kind of similar types of cases around gender. Um, and there was concern that maybe the money's kind of dried up, that people are a bit exhausted with it all. But, I mean, I launched the crowdfunding campaign and I was absolutely overwhelmed with the support that I got. I, I, raised, I raised almost £50,000 within 48 hours from lots of little individual donations. I mean, when I, as of today, I've raised about 70,000, and that's from almost 3,000 different people parting with their hard-earned cash. Um, I'm, I will forever be grateful to those people um, because I could not do this without them. That is really significant to note that it is seemingly the general public chipping in to help. It's obviously people, the you know, the, the average person's very concerned about this issue and sees the injustice of it. And it obviously kind of puts to bed the occasional smear people get that it's usually sort of right wing, powerful, influential, rich, religious entities behind, you know, backing people in your situation. I mean, if if they're giving out money, these these institutions people are talking about, I've never seen any of it. Um it really is individuals and I've had people, I mean, I get so many messages and it, the, the messages are so warming. Um, and a lot of people who, who've, who are kind of using these cases as a vehicle because they don't feel able to stand up themselves. This is kind of their way of being true to themselves. You know, I have people donating as little as five pounds, which is still greatly appreciated and, you know, saying they wish they could give more and that they hope to be able to give more in the future. Um, but yes, it really is made up of lots and lots of tiny donations. Where are we in the, uh, legal proceedings do we have any sort of significant dates in the calendar um so the first claim has gone in it's as i said discrimination and that's against my university provider and then also the accreditation body um th there is I, I haven't made this kind of particularly public yet because I'm, I'm still just waiting to kind of um i need to wait for a, a couple of things to come through but, but there will be a second claim off the back of some other things that have happened over recent months. Um, I'll be hoping to publicise that over the next week or two. So there, there will be an additional claim linked to those the, that, the original claim. Um, we've currently got a preliminary hearing scheduled for early in the new year. Um, and then it's a case of waiting for a trial date. And I have absolutely no idea when this could be. There's quite a, pack, a backlog because of COVID. So I've been told by my lawyers it could be next year or it could even be the year after. See, that's a long time to have something like this hanging over your head, isn't it? I mean, you're taking the right steps. You're, you're seeking recourse through the law, but that doesn't compensate you for having your life thrown into turmoil for the, possibly the next one to two years, does it? Well, this is it. It's kind of, it's kind of on hold. The problem was that I applied to this particular course because it operated on weekends and it allowed me to keep a full time job so that I could pay my way through the course. Um, I've I've done some exploration. I cannot find the same course anywhere else that isn't midweek. And so because I need to keep working full time and keep a roof above my head, it doesn't seem as if I've got an alternative course to go to. So my, my, my life's kind of in limbo at the moment. Um, I'm sorry, have you managed to maintain employment with the same employer throughout this then? They've not obviously 
decided that they would, you know, offer you the same treatment as the uh, the academic institution then? Um, I, I'm, I'm very limited in what I can say about that. What, what I will say is um, it hasn't been without issue. Sure. But, but, but what I will say is that policies and procedures were followed correctly as they should have been. And it, I seem to be OK. Like, I, I, I seem to be pretty safe there now. That's good news, at least, because obviously I appreciate you not wanting to be too expansive on this for obvious reasons. But I imagine your employment would have been a significant target of various online mobs, too. It was. Yeah. But this is this is the thing. I mean, you know, I, I'm aware of some of the individuals now who, who made the complaint to Messanoia, for example, about me. And yes, as you've alluded to, some people did make a complaint to my employer. Um Interestingly, none of these individuals ever dropped me an email or picked up the phone and said, hi, James, by the way, I disagree with you. Can we have a conversation? Had they done that, I would have been only too happy to have a respectful dialogue with them. I never had a single conversation with them. They go straight to your employer, to your place of study. Why? Because they want to seemingly ruin your reputation, even completely ruin your livelihood. I, I, I find it so utterly bizarre and, and, and quite terrifying illustration of the times that we live in when people feel more comfortable trying to get you fired from your job than to simply have a conversation with you. It's crazy to go straight for the livelihood is very sinister to me. You know, this idea of completely destroying everyone, the, you know, their ability to perhaps provide for their family, you know, keep a roof over their head. Uh, and that's, you know, if your reputation manages to stay intact afterwards. I suppose with cancel culture being a relatively new phenomenon when you sort of place it in the realm of the Internet and social media, um, is are there any sort of precedents you can point to that gives you any sort of significant hope that you may be successful in your legal action? Well, you know, part of the problem and part, possibly the reason I'm particularly cynical is because I was kind of, I was kind of double cancelled because, you know, a few weeks after I was expelled from my course, Childline um, basically terminated my volunteering contract with them. Um, you know, and I've been volunteering there for almost six years. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very distraught by that decision um but so it, all of this came at once um going back to your question about um what gives me hope i mean there's a case over in the uk woman's name is maya forstatter yeah um some of your listeners may be familiar with her but basically for the first time um her case demonstrated that gender critical beliefs um are enshrined under the Equality Act and protected under the Equality Act. So you cannot discriminate against someone on the basis of those beliefs. So that, I mean, that's quite huge. And I'll, of course, be seeking to rely upon that authority as part of my case. Um, I mean, I've also seen certain universities in the UK in recent times in which um, academics have come under fire and the universities have actually kind of stood up for them and their right to free speech. But... That seems to be the minority. Uh, the, the majority still seem to be beholden and almost captivated by um, the whims of what can be quite a militant group of, of activists who just want to shut people down. Yeah, it's really concerning. I mean, I suppose you can look at the treatment Kathleen Stocks had as well. That's somebody who actually received some public support from the university but obviously it was just untenable for her to remain there given the hostile reception she was getting day in day out so there is a sort of veto these people have just by their action and um i mean ideally you would like to see a cultural shift wouldn't you as people realizing that okay everyone's going to get their day of cancellation if we all continue down this path uh, but i'm starting to get more and more sympathetic with the legal route, uh, such as yours, such as people uh, suing for libel or defamation. This is something I never would have really supported several years ago. But now I think, well, maybe it's necessary to set that precedent and let people know that there is some recourse if you are treated unfairly. I mean, this seems to me like this is your last resort in this argument. I mean, look, speaking as a former lawyer, I don't I don't recommend litigation to people um, as kind of a first port of call because it can be very expensive. It That's not a great business expensive. model, is it? <laughs> well, it's partly why I left that vocation. <laughs> um, 
But yes, I mean, look, it's, it, yes, I think as you put it, it's a last resort, or sometimes it's the only resort. I mean, as I explained to you, th there was actually nowhere for me to turn but to take legal action. I, I wasn't able to have a conversation with anyone in, internally. Um, so I think it can be a good last resort. Um, I think the fact that people are willing to support these cases and help fund them is also significant. Um, if there is a way of dealing with these things internally, then I would recommend that to people. You know, if you're at an institution in which they've messed up and treated you unfairly, but they're willing to kind of reflect on that and hear you out, and there's a way of coming to some sort of agreement, I think that's always far preferable. But sometimes you don't have that option and you have to resort to this and the law is there for, you know, for a reason. Yeah, that makes great sense. Um, James, this has flown by. Um, I've really been fascinated hearing about your particular situation and I, I do wish you a very positive resolution to it. Is there anything else you'd like to point people towards before I let you get back to your evening? Um, I mean, look, there's so much material out there. Obviously, if people want to keep up to date with my case and also what I generally post on this topic, you can follow me on Twitter. I've got my crowdfunding page, um, which I'm posting regular updates on as well. Um, and I guess just giving a message to people that I know it can be very difficult to stand up for what you believe in, particularly with things as they are at the moment. But, you know, the tide is beginning to turn and it will turn a lot faster if more and more people feel able to just put their head above the parapet. And that, although it might not come without a cost, unfortunately, as I've learned, there, there is something very, very liberating about being true to yourself and your beliefs, really quite powerful. Um, so I would, I would hope that people can feel spurred on by myself and others who are fighting these battles to kind of fight their own mini battles. It's really well put. James, thank you very much for speaking to me. Thank you very much.